Let's dive into the message today. We're talking about the last words of Jesus and how that applies to our lives. So I want to just, disclaimer, I know there's a lot of uh, of new folks in the room that don't know uh, Tiffany and my story, and uh, so I just want to get some things out of the way. You have a pastor with a past right here, all right? Pastor, emphasis on the pasts, okay? It's in capital bold letters, pastor with a past, and so I I come from from drugs and alcohol and, and addiction lifestyle, and I'm, I'm better now, okay? <laughs> Doing a little better now, so everything's okay. You're like, I don't know. Are you sure? You seem kind of spazzy. I'm good. I'm good now. <laughs> I don't know why that was the most funny thing I've said so far. No, I get it. I get it. No, I'm I get it. Okay, so I'm pastor of the past, and I have, we, Tiffany and I have been married for over 11 years, and I have a son who's 18 years old, so do the math. He was, he was born during, during my addiction time, during my addiction time, and uh, I just want to get this out of the way. I, I, was, I was a terrible person. I was. I was a terrible father. There's nothing funny about it. I, I know. You're like, whoa, that really shifted, but it's true. It's true. I, I, I look back on those seasons of my life, and just, I just regret you know, but I know that God led me to it. And I say all that to say this, I'm here now and I've put one foot in front of the other. And there are some of you that feel disqualified. There are some of you that feel like I, I don't deserve to, to be here. I don't deserve to, to have a calling. I don't deserve this because you've been through some things. Maybe you've had some relationship struggles. Maybe you have a past like mine, or maybe you've just made some mistakes along the way and you feel disqualified. I want to let you know that is only when God is beginning to start working with you. And if you would choose to just put one foot in front of the other, just like I did to say, you know what, Lord, I'm, I'm ready to follow you now. Even though I have this past, even though I have this history, even though I've been through this struggle before, Lord, I'm ready to start fresh. God is looking to and fro across the earth for people who are ready to start fresh. Is anybody ready to start fresh today? Is anybody ready to say, you know what? Just use me as I am. Take me as I am. So if you feel that way, get over it. Oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> Just get over it. So Corbin, let me tell you about my son, Corbin. Corbin, um, he, the first two years of Corbin's life, I, I wasn't that good of a parent, like I told you, but I started doing better. I started going to the Salvation Army. I got arrested. I got sent to the Salvation Army, and I, and I got absolutely radically saved. Radically saved. Got just transformed, whatever, never went back. Got my life back on track. Got a couple jobs. Started going to school full time. And I'm, I'm, I'm doing good. And so I get a call. I, I, I'm, I'm so early on. You have to understand, I had no money you know, I'm, I'm riding a Huffy to two different jobs. I'm taking the bus to Stockton to go to Delta College. You see, are you getting the picture here? I was fresh. I was new. And I get this call on uh, one day on my way home from my uh, second job from Coco's. Some of you remember Coco's was right there before Black Bear. Yeah, you, you guys excited about Coco's? I mean, nobody else was. That's why it's not there anymore. I mean, now look at you. <laughs> well, I... I worked there, and um, I was on my way home. I was riding my mountain bike, and my flip phone starts buzzing, you know, in my fifth pocket, my Dickies fifth pocket right here. I take out the, the flip phone. I open it up, and yes, yes, this is child support services calling from Yuba County. I'm like, oh, good. Oh, good. I'm going to tell them how good I'm doing. And they're like, well, uh, we're, so, we're so proud of you. We're so glad that you're doing so well. You owe us $14,000. I'm like, oh my God, oh my God, my, my, my heart started racing. And they, they said, that's all right. Uh, we know you don't have it because we already seized your bank account with, with all $314 in it. And we already seized that up and uh, we know you can't pay it. So what we're going to do is we're going to go ahead and garnish $1,800 a month. Come on, somebody. I was going, praise the Lord, let's go. And I'm like, joke's on them. I don't make close to that. No, I was, I was dying on the inside. I almost fell off my huffy right then and there. Who, come on, wave your hand at me if you've ever had a crazy bad day and the season of life that you're in is just going, what? What's next, right? What's next? We made it through. We made it through, and I got good news for you. The government ain't all that bad. If you, if you do what you're supposed to do, they will sometimes be agreeable. Some people are nodding. Some people are shaking their heads like that. Let's talk after church. It's going to be fine. <laughs> You know that, that phrase, I'm dead, I'm dead? You know, the kids, the, for, for, for kids, that means something's funny. For, I died that day. I died a little bit. I'm dead means I literally, I literally, have you ever got a paycheck before for zero dollars and zero, zero cents? 
miss me with your problems until you get a check for zero dollars and zero cents. That is a true story. I got it worked out. We're okay now. You're like, we're going to go ahead and start passing the baskets now. <laughs> we don't pass the baskets. Don't, don't worry. Don't worry. You're getting score me right now. We don't do that. We don't do that. But we've all been there. We've all been in really bad days. The point of this series is what do we do in the bad day? And the last words of Jesus, because Jesus spoke his last words during the worst day of his life. We call it Good Friday. It was the day he was tortured, beaten, tormented, mocked, ridiculed, and hanging up on that cross. But listen to what Hebrews says about how we're supposed to deal with our bad day. Hebrews 12 says this, keep your eyes on Jesus who both began and finished this race that we're in. We can look to him as our example. It says, study how he did it because he never lost sight of where he was headed, that exhilarating finish in and with God. He could put up with anything along the way. Cross, shame, whatever. And now he's there in the place of honor right alongside God. Like I said, we call it Good Friday, but not for a very good reason, because by the time he was up on that cross, according to the, the gospel of John, the very last words he spoke on that cross was, it is finished. It is finished. And the lesson I want to I wanna bring to us today is that even on his worst day, Jesus had a sense of finality that we can learn from. We can learn from that. Here's the idea. Jesus in his worst moment had a sense of assurance of what God was doing, what he was going to do, and what he was gonna use through his bad day. Today's lesson is this. You can write this down in your notes. If you're taking notes in the bulletin, you can do that. Or if you're taking notes on the YouVersion Bible app, you can just take notes anywhere you can. But we take notes so that we can try to remember these things that, are, that matter so much. And the first lesson, the, this whole concept is centered around this. My struggles have a purpose. Your struggles have a purpose, and your pain has an end. Your struggles have a purpose, and your pain has an end. To get clarity on this idea, I want to talk us through this man in the Bible named Job, where if you're anything like me, starting to read the Bible, that's the book of Job. Uh, the first time I read the Bible, um, the very first time I read the Bible, I was a teenager, and my grandma got me a King James Bible because that's what good grandmas do. They get you a King James Bible, and I flipped to the end. I wanted to see how the story ended. And I started reading about dragons and prostitutes. It was outrageous. <laughs> only Bible people, only people who have read the last, cha- last book of the Bible know what I'm talking about, how that's funny. And I'm a teenager, and I close the book and go, well, this is very educational. <laughs> but when I got saved, and I started reading the book, and it says J-O-B, last time I checked, that's Job. And so I'm going to read the book of Job, but this man, Job, is how you pronounce it. This guy went through a bad day himself, a very, very bad day. He lost everything, everything in the world he lost. He lost his kids. He lost all of his money. He lost everything except his wife, and his wife wasn't exactly the most encouraging lady in the world. Read it for yourself. I'm not going to speak on that because I'm going home with my wife today, and it's going to go good. (laughs) It's going to go good. Job 3020, Job says this. Job says this, I cry to you, O God, but you don't answer. I stand before you and you don't even look. Have you ever felt like this before? I have. I have. I feel like I'm praying and I'm doing everything I'm supposed to do and my prayers are hitting the ceiling and falling straight back down. But God answers Job and says this, the Lord answered Job from a whirlwind and said, who is this that questions my wisdom? Yikes, with such ignorant words. Whoa, brace yourself like a man because I have some questions for you and you must answer them. Where were you when I laid the foundations of the earth? Tell me if you know so much. Sometimes in our prayers, we get into this habit of telling God what we know we need. We tell God what we think or what we know that he needs to do in our life. Like my kids telling me they're six and seven years old. Like my kids telling me who they're going to marry, what kind of house they're going to live in. You know what I'm saying? They know it all. I'm going to marry Leo and he's going to live in, a, we're going to live in a two-story house. And I'm just like, sure you are. Okay. All right. Yeah. Come see me in a year and we'll see, like, we'll see what's going on. But you know, kids, they, they know what they want. They know what they want. They know where they're going to live. They know who they're going to marry. You just nod and say, okay. As a parent, you just nod, you say, okay. But Job, just like that, he smartens up later on and says this in Job 40. He says, Job replied to the Lord and said, I am nothing. How could I ever find the answers? I will cover my mouth with my hand. I have said too much already. I have nothing more to say. This is where Job starts to realize, I don't know everything. I don't know everything. I have spoken out of turn. I don't know what God must be doing. I've made some assumptions about God based on what things look like on the outside. Have you ever done that? Have you ever judged a book by its cover? Don't lie to me. 
I'm see, I see, I'm kidding, I'm kidding, you can lie, I'll just know better. Uh, there, have you ever judged a book by a color? How about this one right here, uh, The Never Ending Story? Have you ever seen this book right here, The Never Ending Story? What a trip, get you some of that book right there. When I was a kid in, uh, in elementary school, they took us all in the cafeteria and we watched this movie. Woo, man, I, it changed me. I was like, whoa, these, what is going on right here? But I got news for you, the story ends. This is actually the story of my parenting season, the never-ending stories. They just, they just go on and on and on and on. Anyone with a seven-year-old girl knows. So if you don't have one of those, just forget it. Just never mind. How about this next book right here? Maybe you might be judged, judging by, by the cover, um, To Kill a Mockingbird. I got news for you. It has nothing to do with any mockingbirds. There's no birds, all right? It's actually... I just I don't know what else to say about it. It has nothing to do with it. You can't judge a book by its cover. Well, you can't judge God by your circumstances. That is, that is something that if you can grab a hold of that, it is going to help you through so many hard times. You cannot judge God by your circumstances. What would serve us best is learning who God really is. So that's what I want to do today. I want to teach you about the attributes of God. I want some attributes of God that I want to, attributes, attributes, I don't know, either way, attributes, attributes. Now I'm going to say it the other way, just for fun. Attributes of God, all right? And in the book of Job, in the book of Job, we can see three of them. Uh, Job 42, verses one through five. I highlighted some verses so maybe you could see them. Job replied to the Lord. He said this, I know you can do anything. There's one. And no one can stop you. You asked, who is this that questions my wisdom with such ignorance? It is I. I was talking about things I knew nothing about. Here's another one. Things too wonderful for me to understand. You said, listen, and I will speak. I have some questions for you, and you must answer. I've only heard about you before. Here's one, another one. But now I've seen you with my own eyes. I want to show you about three attributes of God that are going to really serve you if you learn those things rather than judging God by whatever you might be going through that day, just like I had to do. I had to learn who God really was instead of judging it based on, well, I'm doing all the right things. God must not be as good as I thought. No, 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 no. Number one is this. God is all powerful. God is all powerful, all powerful. The scientific term for this is omnipotent, like omnipotent. He can do anything. He can do anything. Nothing is too big or too small for him. There's nothing outside of his abilities. Come on, get you some of this. Colossians 1 for everything, absolutely everything. God started in him and finds his purpose in him. He was there before any of it came into existence and holds it all together right to this very moment. Come on, can someone praise God in the house today? Because God is all powerful. He can handle what you're going through and he wants to. He wants to. He can handle it. He can deal with the situation that you're going through. And what some of you might think, because I've thought this too. I'm, I'm a pretty average guy, so I know if I've thought it, maybe you've thought it too then why are these things happening? Then why are these bad things happening? If he's all powerful and he can do anything, then, 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 then why am I going through this tough season? I gave my life to you. Uh, why are you punishing me? Why aren't you doing something? It leads us to our second attribute, which is this. God is all knowing. God is all knowing. Are you guys gonna laugh every time I say attribute now? Attribute, attribute. Attribute. He's all knowing. Guys, come on. He's all knowing. Lifeline is too much fun up in here. All-knowing, that it's omniscient. It's the scientific term for that. He's omniscient. He knows everything. Omniscience. He knows everything. He knows absolutely everything. When Job says, things too wonderful for me to understand, Job was acknowledging God's omniscience. You know everything, I don't. You know everything, I don't. We don't know everything. Hebrews 4 says this. He knows about everything, everywhere. Everything about us is bare and wide open to the all-seeing eyes of our living God. Nothing can be hidden from him. What I want to tell you is this. You never need to be afraid to trust your unknown future to an all-knowing God. Let me say it again because I think some of you need that today. You never need to be afraid to trust your unknown future to an all-knowing God. I'd rather have hope in an all-powerful, all-knowing God than certainty in a very limited me. I don't want to trust in my own knowledge. I want to trust in someone who knows it all. I want to put my trust there. And the way I think 
not the way I think things should be, but the way God thinks they should be. Like children, like I, like I mentioned before, children ask for things and they don't even know what they're asking for. My daughter, Emma, she's so sweet. She's like a princess. She really is. She got the looks of Tiffany and the, the, the cunning of her dad to, to get it figured out. And she's got the look. She doesn't even need the cunning, all right? She's so good. And what she, what she knows she needs. Let me tell you what baby Emma knows she needs. Crackers and cheese for every meal. Washed down with Smarties. Washed down with candy. That's every meal for her. Because she knows that's what's best for her. You know what I'm saying? She knows that's what's best. Dad, how could you deprive me on what I know I need? I need this. But what I know is that if she has cheese and crackers for every meal, her next poop will be her last. <laughs> She'll never poop again. And, there, and there's not enough fluoride in the world to fix all those cavities that are going to be messed up, falling out of her face. That's what I know. But what do I know, right? I'm her dad. I don't know anything. Come on, dad, you're just so mean. You know, what do you know? Just let me have some crackers. She never talks like that, but some kids do. And she probably will one day. <laughs> compared to God, compared to God, we think we know some things, don't we? Well, yes, we do. Yes, we do. We think we know. We think we know. So that's why we, we tell them what to do in our prayers. Because we think we know. But the Bible says, I don't have it on the screens for you, but the Bible says when, when we pray, we ought to say, let your will be done. Let your will be done. Compared to God, uh, do you think there are some things that we don't fully understand? Like, for example, like in, in my life, in the season of life that I was in after that, and we were starting to become pastors, and I, I have felonies and everything that from, the, from the distant past, and I was like, I was tithing, I was giving, I was serving in my church before we were pastors, just before we were pastors. And I'm going, God, what do you do? Because I was getting turned away from every job in the world because no one wanted a dirty, rotten, stinking mess up. Like, this, is, this really happened to me. I was getting turned away from every job. When I wanted to get married and needed a real job, nobody wanted me. That's real. That's real. And I'm going, God, hello, can you not see the sacrifice? Can you not see? I'm like getting paid like $80 in tips. I'm like, six, seven, here's your $8, Lord. I'm like doing everything. Come on. And I'm getting turned down after turned down. And aren't we tempted to go, God, that, see, see, I told you, God doesn't, God doesn't want the best for me. Little did I know, little did I know that if I had taken any one of those jobs, I probably wouldn't, we probably wouldn't have taken this calling for as little money as they offered us. <laughs> if I was making any, I'm just being honest. Like if I had gotten a real job and they offered us, you know, $2,800 a month combined, we would have said, sorry, we can't afford that. Whatever. Eh, anyways, that's more details than you probably wanted to know. But that's what, that's what I went through. And you've probably been through something just like that where you're going, I'm doing everything I'm supposed to do. God, where are you? Where are you? But God is all-knowing, and he might know some things around the corner that haven't, hit the, that haven't hit your life yet. He might be preparing you. He might be saving you for a special, a special job. Like you, you're applying for this job, and you're not getting it, and you're like, God, what's the matter with you? Can't you see that this is the perfect job for me? But God might know that, that company's going out of business next year. You know, this, this job, like there's gonna be some people working there that are gonna get you into so much trouble. I'm saving you. Now, I'm not saying you need to check out your mind. You need to use your mind. You need to use your wisdom. But I'm telling you some things that if, if something's not lining up and doors are closing, maybe God's onto something that you're not onto yet. God's all-knowing. Number three is this. God is ever-present. God is ever-present. Omnipresent. That's the scientific term. Omnipresent for always being with us. He's always there. He's always there for you. Hebrews 13 says this, never will I leave you, never will I forsake you. So we say with confidence, the Lord is my helper. I will not be afraid. And when I know God is with me, I can face anything that comes against me. I can face anything that comes against me. When I know God is ever present. There was a woman uh, in the 1800s. Her name was Fanny Crosby. Anybody heard of Fanny Crosby before? Don't spoil it. If you know who she is, all right, I got to see you. Don't spoil it, all right? I'm going to tell you who she is. She lived to be 95 years old, which was pretty good for the 1800s. That's, that's a long time. You know, when they practiced medicine, back then it was a lot more practice, a lot less medicine. You know what I'm saying? It was harder. It was just different. And so when she was born, when Fanny Crosby was born, her, her eyes were a little crossed and she had a little bit of eyesight trouble. And so the doctors got some tools out and started digging around in there. 
This is the, and they messed up her eyesight so bad she got completely blinded by the time she was six weeks old. Six weeks old, completely blind. And if that wasn't bad enough, by six months old, her father died. Grew up with no father, grew up with no eyesight. Fanny Crosby, they say, wrote somewhere between 5,000 and 9,000 hymns for the Lord. One of them was Blessed Assurance. You ever heard of that? Blessed Assurance. Jesus is mine. Oh, if you know it. Oh, what a foretaste of glory divine. Yes, everyone born around that certain age, you're like, yeah, come on, keep singing. Keep singing, Pastor. You don't even, you're not old enough to know that one. Well, in the Salvation Army, they like to do a lot of hymns, all right? So I know a little bit about that one. That's who wrote that. Fanny Crosby, blind woman with no father, had a blessed Blessed, blessed assurance, blessed assurance, that's how they said it. She was assured of some things. I have a feeling she knew about the attributes of God. I can count on him. He is for me. He is with me. Imagine that. A blind, fatherless girl having more faith than us. That God is with her. I love that. I want to give you four blessed assurances today. That if you stay these things over your life, if you remember these things, if you keep that little note card, the little bulletin, and write these in and save it with you. These are things you can say over your own life that'll bless you, okay? Assurance means I know this. And number one is this. I know that God loves me. I know that God loves me. I mean, who else sent their son to die for you lately? A guy named Jeremiah. He was a younger prophet. He was a, a prophet in the uh, Old Testament. That He's like the emo prophet. He wrote the book <laughs> He wrote a book called Lamentations, which just means to complain. He wrote a book on complaining, to lament. Ugh. If he had hair gel, back then it would have been gone like just like this. He was emo. He was the emo prophet. <laughs> That's funny, right? <laughs> That's funny. It's true, though. It's true. He's a complainer from the very beginning. I'm too young. I can't do this. I'm going to go to my room. You don't get me. You just don't understand. I'm I'm all right. He wrote the book on complaining called Lamentations. And even he, even the emo kid had to agree with with this truth about God. Lamentations 3 says this, yet, even with all the complaining, yet I call this to mind and therefore I have hope because of the Lord's great love. We are not consumed for his compassion never fails. and And they are new to us every single morning. Great is thy faithfulness. Great is thy faithfulness. Oh, I'm, I'm, I'm dating myself a little bit. I, sh- I keep my beard low so you can't see all the whites in there. I'm, I'm, I like that stuff, okay? I do like that stuff. The worship team won't let me. Won't let me. Worship team is like looking at me going, no. <laughs> you lie. <laughs> you lie. We love it. The good thing about hymns and the good thing about worship music in general because I know how it is. It's like, it doesn't make sense sometimes and we come in a little bit later because why are we doing this? Music has the ability and these hymns that, that are written have the ability to solidify theological truths, understanding about God in a melodic way that we just wouldn't retain otherwise. Music is powerful, you know this. You know it is. And so when we're worshiping and we, we, we worship with music, we worship with serving, we worship with our lives, but the music really does help us to to know and retain and and sing over our own lives the truths about God. That's why it's so important. That's why we do it every single week. Uh, Great is thy faithfulness. Another great hymn, and the beauty of those hymns is that they solidify it into our heart. The second statement I want to give you that assurance of is number two is this. I know that God has a plan for me. God has a plan for me. In the middle of your bad days, you have to know he is at work in ways that you cannot see. He has a plan for you. Same guy, emo guy, Jeremiah this time. It's a different book called Jeremiah's Named After Him. I guess he decided he wanted the book to be named after him this time. Jeremiah 29, 11, you may have heard this before. It says, I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord. Plans to prosper you and not to harm you. Plans to give you a hope and a future. God has a plan for your life. And we here at Lifeline Church, we wanna help you see that plan. That's why growth track is so important. That's why we talk about it every single week. You're like, I know, growth track, I get it. Every week they're talking about growth track. That's because it's a big deal. 
It's a big step. One is today, and, and Tiffany and I are going to be in there, and we'll, we'll let you know everything you need to know about the church. That way you can kick the ties a little bit. You know what? This is just the church for me. This is the church for me. And we'll stay in there with you and take the time with you to get to know. But as soon as that, that starts to roll out, so next week or the next time, we're not going to do it during Easter, but the next steps that follow that, we help you know your spiritual gifts. And we, we take you through a process so you can know your spiritual gifts, your personality, so you can know the plan that God has built into your life so that you can make a difference. And there's never been a better time in the life of this church, I believe, than right now to, to say, you know what? I'm ready, to, I'm ready to, to take a step towards God. I'm ready to take a step towards God and say, you know what? I can serve one out of every three weeks. I can serve on a one out of three week rotation. That's how we do it around here. And to say, you know what? I, I'm, I'm ready. Maybe I'll do it. I'll just at least try it out. Tiffany and I will be in there we would be honored to spend a little time with you after church today if you'd like to join us for that so that you can know God's plan for you and understand how he wants to use you to make a difference in someone else's life. You know that my life verse and the, the, the verse that has impacted me probably the most, the one I love the most, some of you will know this because I talk about it a lot. He who refreshes others will himself be refreshed. Does anybody need some refreshing today? Refresh someone else. Refresh someone else. Get outside of your own bubble, your own life, and say, you know what? It's not about me today. If you need refreshment, I would encourage you. Come on into Growth Track and, and, and just see what you might enjoy about being on the inside scoop of the church. We want, we want you to be a part of that. We would love it. We would love to have that opportunity with you. And so number three is like this. I know that God wants the best for me. This is where people start to struggle. This is where you might start to struggle and go, oh, I don't know about that. God wants the best for me. Well, then why? Why am I struggling with this? Why am I having to go through that? This one is harder for most people that I talk to because we think that we, if we have a bad day or if bad things happen to us, it means he stopped loving us and that he might want us to suffer for some twisted reason. Well, listen to Romans 8. Listen to Romans 8 that says, no, 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 no. If God is for us, then who can be against us? If God is for us, then who could be against us? Since he did not spare his own son, but gave him up for us all, won't he also give us everything else? Does it mean he no longer loves us if we have trouble or calamity or are persecuted or are hungry or are destitute, whatever you're going through, or if we're in danger or threatened of death? No, despite all these things, overwhelming victory. Let me say that again. Overwhelming victory is ours through Christ who loved us. Last time I checked, victory is good. Victory is a good thing. He wants, he wants that best for you. He wants you to experience victory. It might look a little different than you expected your victory. Like I said, we don't understand everything that God is doing, but let me tell you this, what you think you know about God, like if you think he's out to get you, if you think he's out to punish you, that he's trying to keep you down or teach you a lesson, that's gonna keep you standoffish with God. He doesn't want that. He wants you to be close. He wants you to know that son, that daughter, I want what's best for you. And I want you to experience that. I want you to experience this victory. I want you to know that I am here for you. I'm always with you and I want what's best for you. You have to know he's on your side. Let me explain with a quick story. When I was at my worst, let me tell you about the worst day of my life. I've told this story before. This is my testimony, but I'm gonna try to keep it try to keep it together. I was at the worst day of my life. I was using, I was on drugs back in the, my hometown and I was absolutely miserable. I was ready to be done. I was ready to be done with life. I couldn't, I couldn't get happy if I was high. I couldn't get happy if I had money. I couldn't get happy for any reason at all. And I just knew, I just knew my life was over. My life is over. I can't get ahead. I can't do anything right. This is terrible. I have a six-month-old over there that I, I can't even be present for because I can't break away from the addiction I'm in. I was sitting on a dirty mattress in an apartment room. Get the, get the image. And I am absolutely destitute. And I had never been, I was not raised in church. I didn't know any scriptures. No scriptures at all. No knowledge. I just heard that God might be real. And I thought to myself, you know what? Excuse my language. What the hell? What do I got to lose? And I prayed this prayer lasted about this long. God, if you're real, get me out of this. Prayer over. <laughs> I didn't say amen or anything. I didn't know I needed to. 
I just said, God, if you're real, get me out of this. That night, as I was out being a junkie, I got arrested for the very last time. In the moment, I thought I was, I was toast, going to prison for the rest of my life, whatever. Looking back, I know, when I prayed that prayer, God was sitting on the edge of his cloud. <laughs> and Jesus was there, the Holy Spirit, and he was like, he's gonna say it. He's gonna call out for me. He's gonna call out for us, come on. Whoa, whoa, whoa. He's about to say it, he's about to say it. And as soon as I said it, he hit the Holy Spirit on the back, said, go get him. <laughs> go get him. <laughs> I don't know how else to describe it. This is what happened. And I, I walked into the jail cell for the last time holding my bedroll. Come on, some of you know about a bedroll. I walked in there and I knew, I knew. And I, and I remembered, I prayed the prayer and I'm in here. And the very first appointment I had with my public defender was, you know, you look so scraggly and you're so young, they'll probably give you a program. I said, deal. Sent me to some weird place. Called, they sent me to a thrift store in Stockton. I never heard of Stockton in my life. And why are you going to send me to a thrift store, Salvation Army in Stockton? Where is that, first of all? And why am I going to go work at a thrift store? Just go. Just go. They leapfrogged Sacramento to send me all the way to Stockton. I got saved so radically. I've never used since then. I've never, I, I got saved off of my rocker. It was a mirac. I wasn't perfect. Still am not. But God used that. Would you call getting arrested a bad day? <laughs> Would you call coming down, getting arrested a bad day? But God can use a bad day for good because he wants the best for me. And he had to use any means to get the best for me, but that's what he did. Some people might call Jesus getting hung on a cross a bad day. You know what I'm saying? But God can use a bad day for the good of all humanity to set us free and to cover the sins of the whole world. Amen, somebody. Amen. That's a good day. Last one, last one, last one. Last one is this. Write, write this in your notes, please. This one is so, so important, so important. I know that God will bring me through. He will bring me through. He's our deliverer. He's gonna bring me through. 2 Timothy 4. This is like some of the Apostle Paul's last words. The Lord will rescue me from every evil attack and bring me safely into his heavenly kingdom. To him be the glory forever and ever. Amen. God will bring me through. And some struggle with this point too. I don't know. Man, I've been in this struggle for so long. I've seen someone else struggle for so long. And let me tell you, I've been through that too. Inside of our first year of pastoring, Tiffany already had her license for a long time. She was already preaching a long time. But I, I was newer. I got my license later and I... You know, he's in our first year of leading the church. And there was a man named Larry, who um, some of you know, there's a few of us still that know who Larry is, Pastor Larry. My friend, my mentor, the one who taught me how to play guitar and lead worship. He was the one in the office all day, every day. So when I was, you know, just around and I would come into the church and he would show me how to, you know, keep the books or, you know, whatever random thing he's doing that day, I was just with him. He's my friend. And then we got called to lead the church. And inside of that first year of us leading the church, he got sick. The big kind of sick. And uh, we prayed and prayed and prayed and do everything a miracle believing church knows how to do. Prayed and prayed and prayed. And he passed away. My very first funeral. My very first funeral was my friend. A pastor. A guy who's living his life right. It wasn't fair. It's not fair. This doesn't make any sense. Here I am. I'm supposed to give hope and encouragement to everybody, and I don't know what's going on. Why? Why would God take him? You know, it was really sad. It was sad for us, all of us. He didn't deserve that. But on his, on his literal deathbed, we would go in. We would go into the hospital. And we would, we would talk to him and pray for him. And he was so frail. He was so skinny. And anybody who was there remembers that he would say things like, I got the heavenly crown waiting for me. I'm going to dance with him in glory. Faith I couldn't understand at the time. I couldn't understand it. I was just a kid, you know. But it made me remember that we're in a race and we all have a finish line 
And Pastor Larry saw his finish line and knew that he had a crown waiting for him at the end of that race. Second Timothy 4. I have fought the good fight. I have finished the race. I have remained faithful. And now the prize awaits me, the crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, will give me on the day of his return. And the prize is not just for me, but for all who eagerly look forward to his appearing. That's you. That's you, church. That's you, family. Philippians 1.21. For to me, living means living for Christ and dying is even better. I try to talk to my kids about this and they don't understand fully yet, but I, I, try, I try to talk to myself about this and I'm not sure I understand fully either. Larry knew, but this truth remains the same. God will bring you through. What do you do to a person with this, with this perspective in life? What can you do to hurt a person who knows if you live, you're gonna live for Christ. If you die, that's even better. What can you do to somebody like that? Nothing, nothing. That's what I call living in victory. That's what I call being assured of who God is and what he wants to do in our lives. When you give your life to Jesus, your struggles have a purpose and your pain has an end. With Jesus, every struggle you have is used to glorify God and to build you up. Even if the result is death, the outcome of all pain as a Christ follower ends up with joy. That's what I call a blessed assurance. That's what I call a blessed assurance. And that's the assurance I want you to have. Church, if you don't have that, I want to offer it to you today. I want to, and it's very, very simple. It may not always be easy to live for Christ. I'll admit that. But it is very simple. Make Jesus your Lord and Savior. To make Jesus a Savior means I believe that you died on the cross for my sin. I received that. But to make him our Lord means I'll do the things you said to do on this side of heaven. And if you're ready to take that step today, I want you to bow your heads and close your eyes with me. I want to pray over you. And I want to invite you into this moment. Church, it's a very, very sacred moment. So try to be praying for those next to you and just have this sense of expectancy with you. Father, in Jesus' name, I ask for open hearts and open minds today to receive your love, to receive your grace, to receive your forgiveness, to receive your lordship as well. To know that all pain that we experience has a purpose. All of our struggles can be used to build us up. So if you're here today and you've never made that choice in and of your own self, maybe someone else made that choice for you, you were raised in church and your grandma made that choice for you, but you've never really did it for yourself to say, I'm ready to make Jesus my Lord and Savior. Today's your day. Or maybe you used to live that way, but you know you haven't been living that way lately. For both parties, This is your moment. God welcomes you back into his kingdom so freely. If that's you today and you're ready to take that step, would you lift your hand with me today? Come on, just lift it up. Amen, I see you. I see you and you and you and you and you and you. Oh my goodness. Hallelujah. Church, let's pray together as a church. If this is you, just pray it. Say it right after me and say it. Say it with confidence. Say it like it's yours, okay? Say, Father God, I give you my heart. I give you my life. Thank you for sending your son Jesus to die on a cross for my sin. I receive him as Lord and Savior. Fill me with your Holy Spirit and make me new. In Jesus' name, amen.